The year was 1909, and Manhattan's financial district was about to witness an act that would have been unthinkable just a decade earlier. The Gillander Building, a technological marvel that had pioneered the art of building tall on tiny plots, was sold for a price that made headlines across the nation. $822 per square foot, a figure that would equal millions in today's money. And yet, it wasn't the sale that shocked New Yorkers. It was the buyer's intentions. You see, new owner Bankers Trust wasn't interested in the building's elegant design or its modern amenities. In fact, they had purchased this 13-year-old skyscraper for the sole purpose of tearing it down. In today's episode, we'll tell the full backstory, detailing how this decision would mark a watershed moment in architectural history as we describe. Why New York demolished its first Gilded Age skyscraper? The 1890s marked a transformative period in Manhattan's development as the city grappled with unprecedented growth and technological change. The introduction of steel frame construction techniques, first demonstrated in Chicago's home insurance building, revolutionized what was possible in urban architecture, freeing builders from the limitations of load-bearing masonry walls that had restricted building heights for centuries. Simultaneously, the refinement of the safety elevator, pioneered by Elisha Otis's dramatic demonstration at the 1854 World's Fair in New York's Crystal Palace, had matured into reliable systems capable of serving increasingly tall structures. The financial district, already the heart of American commerce, found itself at the forefront of this vertical revolution. And the completion of Richard Morris Hunt's New York Tribune Building in 1875 and George Post's Equitable Life Building in 1870 had demonstrated the district's appetite for tall buildings, but it was Bradford Gilbert's Tower Building of 1889, rising 11 stories on a lot just 21.5 feet wide, that truly showed what was possible on restricted sites. Land values in the district had reached unprecedented levels, with prime corners commanding prices that would have seemed impossible a generation earlier, creating intense pressure to maximize the potential of every square foot. Into this environment of rapid technological advancement and soaring real estate values, the Gillander Building emerged as one of the era's most ambitious projects. It followed in the wake of successful towers like the Manhattan Life Insurance Building, which had become the world's tallest building at 348 feet, and the American Surety Building, whose architect Bruce Price had demonstrated how steel frame construction could create elegant tall buildings. The Gillander development faced a fundamental challenge, how to create economically viable office space on a plot measuring just 26 by 73 feet, 7.9 meters by 22.3 meters, dimensions that would have been considered suitable for only a modest structure in previous decades. The answer lay in the new possibilities offered by steel frame construction, refined through the work of engineers like William LeBaron Jenny in Chicago. Unlike traditional masonry buildings, which required increasingly thick walls at their base as they grew taller, exemplified by the eight-foot-thick base walls of the Monadnock building in Chicago, steel frame structures could maintain relatively consistent wall thicknesses throughout their height. This innovation was particularly crucial for the Gillander building's site, where every inch of interior space was precious. The building's development proved that valuable commercial structures could rise from even the most constrained urban plots, following the example set by the tower building, but pushing it to new heights. This approach to maximizing limited space would become increasingly important as Manhattan's development continued, setting a precedent for future generations of slender towers. The project demonstrated that with proper engineering and design, the economic limitations of small lots could be overcome through vertical development. And the timing of the Gillander building's construction coincided with a broader transformation of Lower Manhattan's skyline, as the financial sector boomed in the wake of the merger movement of the 1890s, banks and insurance companies sought to establish prominent architectural presences in the district. The resulting competition for height and visibility drove innovation in building techniques and design, with each new project pushing the boundaries of what was considered possible. The architectural partnership of Charles I. Berg and Edward H. Clark approached the Gillander Building's design with a clear understanding of the unique challenges posed by the site. And Berg, already known for his work on the Chemical National Bank Building and the Manhattan Athletic Club, brought significant commercial experience to the project. Their solution would need to maximize usable floor space 
while creating a structure that could withstand the physical forces acting on such a tall, slender building. The project's execution required careful coordination between the architects, consulting engineer Henry Post, who had worked on several early skyscrapers including the American Tract Society building, and general contractor Charles T. Wills, whose firm would later construct the Metropolitan Life North building. The resulting structure rose to 273 feet, incorporating 20 stories, a height that placed it among New York City's tallest buildings at the time of its completion, alongside George Post's St. Paul building and Kimball and Thompson's Manhattan Life Insurance building. The main building contained 17 floors of office space, with three additional stories housed within an ornate cupola that crowned the structure. This vertical organization represented a careful balance between maximizing rentable space and creating an architecturally distinguished profile on the skyline, following the example set by earlier towers like the American Surety Building. The building's construction employed the most advanced techniques available in the 1890s, building upon methods pioneered in Chicago's early skyscrapers. The steel framework, essential for achieving such height on a restricted footprint, required precise engineering calculations to ensure stability against wind loads, a particular concern given the building's unusual height-to-width ratio. Each beam and column had to be carefully sized and positioned to support the structure while maintaining maximum usable interior space, using techniques refined from Bradford Gilbert's tower building, which had demonstrated the viability of steel cage construction on narrow lots. The exterior walls, freed from their traditional load-bearing role by the steel frame, as first demonstrated in the home insurance building, could be relatively thin throughout the building's height. This allowed for larger windows than would have been possible in a masonry structure like the earlier Potter building, providing essential natural light to the narrow floor plates. The architects wrapped the steel skeleton in a combination of facing materials, including limestone and terracotta, materials that had proven their durability on earlier skyscrapers, like the Guaranty Building in Buffalo. The building's vertical circulation system had to be carefully planned to serve all floors efficiently while taking up minimal space on the already constrained floor plates. Drawing lessons from the success of the Pulitzer Building and other contemporary towers, the architects incorporated multiple high-speed elevators, essential for maintaining reasonable wait times for tenants and visitors in an era when elevator technology was still evolving. At the time of its completion, the Gillander Building represented one of the most advanced examples of high-rise construction techniques, incorporating lessons learned from a decade of skyscraper development in both New York and Chicago. Its presence among New York City's tallest structures demonstrated that significant height could be achieved even on extremely limited plots, providing a model for future development in crowded urban areas and influencing designs like the later Flatiron Building. During its brief 13-year lifespan, the Gillander Building stood as one of the most prominent addresses in New York's financial district. Its location at the intersection of Wall and Nassau Streets placed it at the very heart of American finance, sharing the block with J.P. Morgan & Co. S headquarters at 23 Wall Street, known as The Corner, and sitting diagonal to the New York Stock Exchange. The sub-treasury building, now Federal Hall, stood directly across Nassau Street, while the imposing Bankers Trust building rose nearby at 14 Wall Street. The building's position within the financial district reflected the area's intense concentration of economic power during the early 20th century. By 1900, Wall Street had become not just the center of New York's financial world, but the nucleus of American capitalism itself. The presence of institutions like the House of Morgan, which orchestrated major industrial consolidations including U.S. Steel's formation in 1901, drew other financial firms to the area. The National City Bank, now Citibank, operated from 52 Wall Street, while the First National Bank occupied its Renaissance Palazzo-style building at 2 Wall Street. Every major bank, brokerage house, and financial services firm sought to establish a presence in this compact neighborhood, driving property values to unprecedented heights. The Gillander Building's efficient use of its constrained site demonstrated the economic potential of vertical development in dense urban areas, following the example set by the Mills Building and the Equitable Life Building, which had first proven the viability of large-scale office buildings. Its successful operation proved that even the smallest lots could be transformed into valuable office space through innovative design and engineering. 
The building's presence on such a prominent corner served as a daily reminder of how steel frame construction was transforming the possibilities for urban development. Much as the nearby American Surety Building and Manhattan Life Insurance Building had done. The building's narrow floor plates, while challenging from a layout perspective, offered tenants something increasingly valuable in the crowded financial district, access to natural light and air. Traditional large footprint buildings like the Mills Building often left interior offices dark and poorly ventilated, but the Gillander Building's slender profile meant that most spaces had windows and external views. This advantage was particularly notable given the growing awareness of office working conditions following the 1890 publication of Jacob Rees's How the Other Half Lives and subsequent reform movements. During the first decade of the 20th century, the building witnessed a period of extraordinary economic growth and transformation in American finance. The merger wave that created many of today's major financial institutions was in full swing exemplified by the 1908 merger of First National Bank and National City Bank. The Panic of 1907, which began at the nearby Knickerbocker Trust Company and led to J.P. Morgan's famous interventions from his offices across the street, demonstrated both the district's vulnerabilities and its central importance to American finance. The demand for premium office space in the financial district continued to intensify driven by the expansion of firms like Bankers Trust Company, founded in 1903 specifically to serve the growing number of banks in the area. The building's brief existence coincided with a crucial period in New York's development, as the city cemented its position as the world's financial capital. Between the Gillanders' completion in 1897 and its demolition in 1910, Lower Manhattan saw the rise of numerous significant structures, including the Trinity Building, the U.S. Realty Building, and the Singer Building, at the time the world's tallest building. Its success demonstrated that architectural innovation could create valuable commercial space even on the most restricted sites, though ironically, this very success would contribute to the economic forces that led to its demolition. In December 1909, the announcement of the Gillander Building sale sent shockwaves through New York's real estate community. Bankers Trust's purchase price of $822 per square foot set a new record for Manhattan real estate, surpassing even the recent high-profile transactions like the $700 per square foot paid for the Equitable Life Building site in 1908. The price was particularly stunning given that the building was barely a dozen years old, and still functioning as modern office space, equipped with amenities similar to those in newer buildings like the Singer Tower and the Metropolitan Life Tower. The decision to demolish such a recent structure marked a turning point in New York's architectural history. While the replacement of older buildings was common exemplified by the 1908 demolition of the original Grand Central Terminal, the Gillander Building was the first modern steel frame skyscraper to face the wrecking ball. Its demolition, carried out between April and June 1910, demonstrated that even the most advanced buildings could be considered temporary in the face of economic pressure. This stood in stark contrast to the prevailing belief that steel frame construction, as championed by buildings like Adler and Sullivan's Guarantee Building in Buffalo, represented a permanent transformation of the urban landscape. The decision reflected the rapidly changing nature of corporate America. The financial sector's consolidation wave had created institutions that required far more space than the modest floor plates of 1890s skyscrapers could provide. Bankers Trust itself, founded in 1903, had grown from a specialized bank serving other financial institutions into a major force requiring significant space. The company's decision to demolish the Gillander Building paralleled similar moves by other financial giants, such as the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company's replacement of the Dr. Parkhurst Church with its landmark tower in 1909. The three-month demolition process attracted considerable attention from both the public and the engineering community. Thompson Starrett Company, the demolition contractor, faced unprecedented challenges in safely dismantling a steel frame structure of this height. The company had recently completed the demolition of John Jacob Astor's Hotel Waldorf Astoria to make way for the Empire State Building, but the Gillander's steel frame presented unique challenges. Engineers from other construction firms, including Fuller Construction, builders of the Flatiron Building, and George A. Fuller Company, visited the site to study the demolition techniques. 
The process required innovative safety measures to protect neighboring structures like J.P. Morgan's headquarters at 23 Wall Street and the bustling stock exchange. The methodical dismantling of the building's steel skeleton, which had to be carried out without the benefit of modern crane technology, provided valuable lessons that would inform future projects like the 1920s demolition of the Singer Building. The replacement structure, the 39-story Bankers Trust Building, now 14 Wall Street, exemplified the new approach to commercial architecture. Designed by Trowbridge and Livingston, whose American Security and Trust Company building in Washington, D.C. had demonstrated their mastery of the neoclassical style, the new tower featured significantly larger floor plates than its predecessor. Its stepped pyramid crown, inspired by the mausoleum at Halicarnassus, became an instant landmark and influenced setback requirements in the 1916 zoning resolution. The Gilenda Building's demolition established precedents that would reshape Manhattan throughout the 20th century. The site's transformation from a slender 1890s tower to a massive corporate headquarters previewed similar changes across the city, from the replacement of the Singer Building with one Liberty Plaza to the ongoing redevelopment of Park Avenue's older office buildings. Its brief lifespan demonstrated that in New York, architectural merit and structural soundness could be secondary to economic potential, a principle that would guide Manhattan's development for generations to come. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. What is your opinion on the aesthetic of the Gillander building? Was it beautiful and ahead of its time, or was it a bit too early, and its slenderness stood out against other Gilded Age buildings? Our channel thrives off of your thoughts so be sure to leave us your comments below. With that said, thanks for joining us for another episode of Old Money Mansions, and cheers until next time.